Welch, the uh, Dean of Miami Business School, and I'm delighted to welcome Sean Bratches, uh, who is uh, Managing Director of Commercial Operations for Formula One. Well, it, it's, it's good to be here. And well, I think we're actually in the store auditorium. Is that accurate? That's correct, yeah. So my understanding is that Peter Store donated the funds to support this, this beautiful facility you have. And ironically, my first job out of college was working for Store Television. Right. And I sold advertising time in their owned and, and operated rep firm. Right. I'm actually in Dallas. I didn't spend a lot of time... Uh, west of the Hudson River uh, right. after I got out of school, you know, before I had got out of, gotten out of school. And so it was a great opportunity. But uh, I know the store family well and, uh, and the brand, both on the cable side and the, and the broadcast side. Well, thank you very much for uh, recognizing that. Uh, uh, I didn't know It wasn't a commercial pop, you know, it was just... <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 I have to confess, I, I made a few dollars on store communication stock in its day, so good, uh, good, good. we all did well out of the store connection. Well, I was glad I was out there selling for you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, anyway, let's uh, take it uh, fast forward to 2018. Uh, you're in Miami. Um, we're in conversation about possibly the 2020 Grand Prix for F1 in uh, Miami. Tell us about the uh, importance of the U.S. market to F1 and why Miami in particular. I think you know, Formula One is, uh, is uniquely positioned in the world of sport. There's really three global sports properties, uh, the Olympics, the World Cup, and Formula One. The former two occur once every four years in one country. Formula One takes place every year in 21 countries in five continents. So we're, we're tru truly global. And we have, we're sitting in a very favorable position in as much as uh, countries, cities, municipalities, principalities are keen on having Formula One come to their location and race. Um, I think, you know, at, from an outset standpoint, there's a massive amount of civic, civic pride that goes along with that. But at the same time, uh, the economic impact of hosting a Formula One is extraordinary. It extends in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year to the host countries. Uh, we have 21 Grand Prix, as I mentioned, and 18 of them are underpinned by government. And most of those governments actually execute economic impact studies independent of us and it's their data that, that surfaces that. And I think, you know, we have a unique ability to shine a light on a country. Uh, last year in 2017, our cumulative television audience was 1.8 billion people. Um, we uh, create an extraordinary amount of jobs locally during a Grand Prix, both permanent and, um, and part-time. Uh, there's volunteerism. Uh, you know, being the most technologically advanced sport on the planet, you know, we have an extraordinary amount to give back in terms of STEM. We have a great program under the auspices of Formula One in schools where we teach boys and girls about science, technology, engineering, and math, but in a Formula One environment, which is really exciting, cool, and neat, right. and things that they can, they can get around. So the other aspect I think is really important is that I'm... When you look at the uh, Grand Prix we have today, 58% of all attendees come from a different country than the Grand Prix is hosted. So we really are extremely international. And I think, um, you know, while we are the benefit of being a, you know, uh, a very attractive property to a lot of countries around the world, and it's... Uh, you know, it's a little like musical chairs. We only have so many, and when it's filled, you know, the music stops. Uh, so there, while there's great interest, I think there's great interest from Formula One standpoint um, in Miami. I, you know, I, I really feel that the brand attribute, attributes of Miami and Formula One are very well lined up. Uh, you know, they're very, they're both progressive, you know, Miami's a progressive city, uh, Formula One is in the bleeding edge of technology. They're both about fashion. They're about glamour. They're about luxury. Um, they're both global. Uh, we have an international fan base. Miami is certainly a city that is representative of an international constituency of, of you know, the population. So 
I think it's a, uh, it, you know, it would be a good marriage of brands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we want to do, and we've been very cadenced over the last year and a half in terms of um, talking to citizens groups, talking to local businesses, talking to the respective um, government officials and, and commissions and other impacted entities. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm a realist. So I feel good about it, but there's, you know, it, it's complicated, particularly in a, uh, in a city like Miami from a political standpoint. Sure, sure. Let's just step back a bit. Uh, Liberty, you want to answer questions? You want to ask questions? You want me to just keep going? Liberty Media, <laughs> uh, Liberty Media took over F1 in 2016, correct? January 23rd of 17. 17. What is the strategy of F1 now versus what it was before Liberty came in? No, I, I think Liberty is a, uh, I'd say a very, um, uh, edu you know, they're a savvy investor, they're a, um, a smart investor, and they've got a cornucopia of assets that, um, that you know, extend from Ticketmaster to TripAdvisor to the Atlanta Braves to uh, Charter Cable and Formula One. And they looked at Formula One, they thought there were really three reasons that they invested in it. The first being, it's a global brand, mm -hmm. half a billion, over half a billion fans, and a pretty decent balance sheet. Secondly, is that in a world where technology is disintermediating the way consumers ingest content, um, the thesis being that live sports is the last genre that on a predictable basis can aggregate large audiences that can be monetized. And the third reason is the, the belief, and I fully believe all three, but this one in particular, that it was, a, it was an undermanaged asset. Uh, you know, when I, um, I accused Liberty and Media of, of bait and switching me, they called me and asked me to uh, move to London and run the business of Formula, the business side of Formula One. When I got there, there was no business. You know, there was, there was no marketing department, no research group, no strategy group, no sponsorship group, no media rights group, no hospitality events, marketing, nothing. And um, so... It was all in uh, Bernie's head. It was, well, he actually ran it out of his home. And I, and I, and I, I, you know, I, give, him a, I give him a lot of credit. But at the same time, you know, I think you know, we're trying to take this from a, you know, kind of I'll call it, my, the analogy I use is from the Sears and Roebuck catalog to the internet in, in light speed. Mm -hmm. And I was, it's a little bit of a professional gift for me on many, uh, on many levels, having spent almost three decades at ESPN, uh, coming into a circumstance like this where I had the heads of all these, or these groups that I, I was creating, but no leadership in them. So I was able to go out and what I think was create a, an extraordinary edit of of a diverse group to kind of comprise and run the right. Formula One business. Right. Now, the group that I've hired, you know, we are not all petrol heads, and, and, I, and I'm admittedly not a petrol head. Uh, we have those on the motor and sporting sure. track. You know, I'm the guy who shows up, don't know which way the cars go around the track. <laughs> but I am massively passionate about the business around sport, and I've spent my career in that. And I'm very encouraged about you know, this journey that we've started, um, having, you know, we're in an investment stage right now, and I think we're starting to grow out of that. Uh, we've created a strategic plan that we're, that we're working on diligently. Um, we, you know, to answer your question earlier, I mean, I, I would, I, your initial question, I think, is that, you know, ultimately we're trying to make the racing on the, on the circuit better, uh, and we're trying to do a better job of engaging the fans, and we're trying to create monetization opportunities sure. that either weren't being exploited at all or that need to be developed. In terms and of merchandising, sponsorship. Uh, uh, it goes race promotion, right. sponsorship, um, media rights. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we were probably the only sport platform on the planet that was losing money in digital. We just launched a responsive web platform four weeks ago. Prior to that, uh, you know, the, the Miami Business School couldn't have bought a display ad on FormulaOne.com. I mean, or really? a pre-roll, post-roll, mid-roll, any, anything. Right. So well, when one of the first things that I did when I arrived was I mean, we needed to 
understand what the fan thought about us, because not only wasn't there a research department, there was no research to, su you know, to support anything. Sure. So um, I engaged Wyden and Kennedy yes. and Flamingo, and in partnership with them, did a global brand study across four continents. Uh, we interviewed 10 avid Formula One fans on each continent for seven hours over two days. Uh, we did six focus groups comprised of 10 people each on each continent, one comprising all avid fans, one casual F1 fans, uh, one former fans, motorsport fans, spectacle fans, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We did digital um, analytics against digital platforms on, on each, in each continent and did online surveys. And we came up with, a, with reams of data in terms of what people thought about us. And you know, our mission statement came from that, which is to unleash the greatest racing spectacle on the planet. And uh, we came out with five North Stars that we live by every single day. Uh, breaking borders, um, uh, putting the spectacular back into the spectacle, uh, taste, the, uh, taste the oil, feel the blood boil, and um, revel in the racing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, revel in the racing is all about creating a better experience, a, a more competitive grid. You know, right now, uh, you've got the top t three teams that are investing uh, at, a, at a level of th four or five X what the, 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 the last seven teams are, 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 right. in, are investing. And that investment is creating a gap in, right. in the racing. And you know, one of the things we learned in this research study is that speed is inherent to the sport. Everybody expects that. But what they really love about Formula One is racing. It's wheel to wheel, livery yes. to livery racing. So our objective is to get the back of the grid up to the front of the grid. And yes. we've got a, uh, probably you know, one of the greatest legends in the sport, and Ross Braun, who, among other things, ran the Ferrari team for a number of years. Right. And he's developing the next generation engine and livery. And you think, you know, right now, when you have uh, a trailing car, the dirty air coming out of it um, eliminates 70, 80% of the downforce on the trailing car. So its ability to overtake is, is mini, minim, you know, mitigated. And the new livery um, in terms of airflow dispersion right. uh, is going to you know, massively lower, lower that. So then um, you know, putting the spectacular back into the spectacle, when you go to a you know, University of Miami, Notre Dame football game or Knicks Bulls game or Chelsea Arsenal game, you, know, you go for two or three hours and you go home. Maybe the students do a little thing, but you and I. And when you go to a Grand Prix, you're there for three or four days. You're spending six, seven, eight hours a day there. And you know, we needed to kind of create an element of, of entertainment, of spectacle. So we're injecting, you know, uh, I would say, a festival type environment you know, within there. Right. Um, breaking borders is all about the conceit coming out of the research that Formula One is an impenetrably exclusive sport. So while we like the exclusivity, we're trying to create seams in that veil of exclusivity where people can touch and play with our content. In fact, today, downtown on Biscayne Boulevard, we ran a number of Formula One cars to, to do such, just that. We're trying to bring the show to the people to, you know, to elevate um, you know, what's, what's transpiring, to move their, their viscery. And then the last two are you know, um, Taste the Oil is all about elevating the extraordinary engineering in the sport. You know, most people don't know that you can't refuel a Formula One car after the Grand Prix has started and they don't give you anywhere near enough fuel to finish the race. It's almost a GMAT question. Mm -hmm. right? And so between 30 and 45% of the energy that propels these cars is harvested from brake and exhaust heat. So these are stories, not only the right, technology, right. but also the scientists, the engineers behind them. And the last one's obviously about the drivers. Um, you know, taste, uh, feel the blood boil. We want to kind of unleash these drivers. It, you know, I'll sit there and I'll watch Lewis Hamilton win a race on, and in, in the motor home at a Grand Prix and he's crowd surfing with his helmet on. I'm like, you know, take that helmet off. You know, we want to, you know, we want to market you. you. You are the hero. So uh, it's an exciting time. I think at Formula right. One, it's a great time to be a fan. And I think we're energized about, you know, the, the opportunity. Um, in terms of where we sit, we take it extremely seriously. Well, I, th I think it's great, everything you're doing, because the sense I've had when I've been uh, 
at uh, F1 races in person, uh, which I've done in Montreal and Shanghai and sure. uh, Monaco. You know, the, uh, the age of the attendees seems to be uh, a little bit higher than I would have expected. And I, I imagine that what you're trying to do is also refresh what is now, I think, about a 70-year-old brand. Yeah, this is our 68th year. Okay. And um, I think, you know, I feel pretty good. Um, our average age is 39, 40, okay. so it's consistent with, with other sports. But you, you make an excellent point. I mean, you know, we need to engage and kind of engender the next generation of consumer. Uh, one of the things when Liberty first called me in, you know, called June of 2016, I started following Lewis Hamilton and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, and others and, um, in the sport. And I was really surprised that Lewis, as an example, wasn't using Formula One iconography in his social media feeds. I so I had lunch with him uh, prior to the 17 season starting, and I asked him about this. And he put down, you know, basically a stack of cease and desist orders that were sent to him by the prior management um, because they looked at it as a an immediate revenue source, as opposed to really what this is is a is a marketing platform to. Right. Kind of you know indirectly drive consumers fans engagement right, which can be monetized point, right. in, in, in other areas so i immediately issued uh, social you know put out social media guidelines not only for the drivers but for the teams for the promoters for the sponsors um, we uh, rebuilt as i mentioned uh, our website from the ground up uh, brand new responsive web platform that launched uh, about four weeks ago um, we've launched a new direct-to-consumer non-live app with te telemetry and radio and mm -hmm. archival content. Um, we launched a product called F1 Television, uh, which is uh, 24 live feeds of each Grand Prix, five different languages, going to 58 countries around the world right now. And uh, to engender that, also, we've launched a fantasy platform. I would say in the digital arena, right, we've right. launched uh, an, an eSports league uh, which we're incredibly excited about. Uh, one of the reasons being is that I think we're uniquely positioned in the world of eSport because the athletes in, that play our game, uh, the, F, you know, the yeah, F1 sorry. game, are actually sitting in very sophisticated simulators where they're, they're adjusting the, the, you know, the brake tension, the clutch yes. tension, the yes. accelerator, yes. The same steering wheels as Max Verstappen holds onto, where is if you're playing you know, FIFA or the NBA or Madden, you know, you're doing this looking at a computer screen. So we think there's some interesting elements in terms of engagement, you know, through eSport. But in the, in the macro sense, mm -hmm. you know, our partnership, we did a Twitter post Grand Prix show. We've done a partnership with Facebook. We've done a partnership with Snapchat. You know, we're pushing out into the, um, in the social media world, we're extremely proactive. Uh, we're learning a lot in terms of what mm -hmm. works, what doesn't work. And I think you know the reaction has been you know really positive from a fan base that I think has been just kind of latently sitting waiting for you know the just the extraordinary uh, you know uh, sounds and smells and, and visuals and characters in the sport to be elevated in a very unique way. Right. Uh, any plans for uh, online gaming? So we um, recently announced, and I would say, you know, you know, in the past month, give me a week or two on either side, a, um, a, a deal where we, we've, we licensed our data um, to a, and an entity that is going to push it out globally to, for us to get into the, the betting marketplace. Um, one of the extraordinary things about Formula One that has not been exploited is this cloud of content that sits above us. So each of the 20 cars yes. has 120 sensors on each one, yes. on each car, mm -hmm. and they push out 1,500 points of data every second of every Grand Prix. Each Grand Prix has 20 sensors embedded below the surface to pick up loop times and timing. Mm -hmm. There's also beacons around, around the rest of the track to pick up other data and analytics. And all this has been laying fallow. So um, we did a, no, I guess we did two things. Is, is one, for some reason, we didn't have a technology partner. And uh, we just did a, a global sponsorship deal with Amazon, which is gonna help unleash this trove of data. 
You know, we're you know, looking at things like um, you know, who's last to break in every turn <laughs> and who's first. Um, and and you know, which, are, which I think from a consumer standpoint are very right. interesting. And also from a driver standpoint, you don't want to be first to break, right? You, know, right. you want the hero award going right. in. Right. And it could actually elevate more exciting racing. But at the same time, the betting marketplace, which is exploding around the world, has been really relegated to uh, you know who's going to win you know that that you know very pedestrian or content. The spread. Pardon me. Yeah. The spread. Yeah. E exactly. So now we on a, on a I think on a very sophisticated basis are going to surface uh, data that is going to create betting markets within Formula One that fans can engage with and it's just another opportunity for them mm -hmm. to touch our sport. Yeah. Uh, one aspect of that I think it's important to note is that the integrity of the data is critical. And you know, we've retained a, a firm called Sport Radar who's going to um, in, well first you know, ensure that you know, what we're sending out from, from each of the 21 Grand Prix, whether it's practice, whether it's qualifying, whether it's the Grand Prix, and ultimately F2, F3 and, and other, other races is accurate because there's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars that are, that are traded in the marketplace over there. So that's really important. And then the provisioning to them of historic data, which they can an, you know, look at and analyze trends to ensure that um, no one's manipulating it for, for, for their benefit. Because yeah. I think you know, the, you know, you know, from a brand standpoint, we've got an incredibly strong brand. Sure. And Huge you know, integrity you know, outside risk. of you know, people in, in, in a company, the brand is the strongest thing companies have, and, and we're very conscientious of that and um, taken into consideration as we're getting into that marketplace. Coming back to uh, Miami for a moment, uh, of course, uh, we're very much threatened here by uh, ocean rise and climate change, so I'm sure some people in the city will have some sustainability questions uh, for F1. What, what is your approach on the sustainability issue for the environment. How is F1 uh, addressing that or helping to uh, mitigate uh, the impact of its activities? Sure, so I think um, th there is an extraordinary story around sustainability um, in Formula One. Uh, the aerodynamics that are adopted in Formula One are leveraged by brands like Mercedes and Renault and McLaren and Ferrari who are in the sport to impute into the cars that they sell to people around the globe. Mm -hmm. The material science, like carbon fiber as an example, uh, were developed in Formula One that reduce the weight of the cars and those two have been adopted uh, into you know, the OEMs ar ar around the world and, and how they, they um, construct cars in a much more efficient way. Uh, the engine, you know, the, the hybrid as, as an example, developed in, in, in Formula One, those technologies and those um, elements are being used in the uh, kind of the pedestrian car market. So I think mm -hmm. that there's inherent development within Formula One that is used and you know um, rear view mirrors seat belts were all developed in formula one and not too many not too, you know suspension systems and not too many people know this we need to tell that story better we in fact just did a, um, a, a we have a collaboration with another business school called mit sloan uh, and we have a partnership with them where we are using their management frameworks to kind of elevate the extreme innovation that takes place in Formula One. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've had a conference in, in Milan. We had one Thursday, uh, two days ago, or three days ago, in, two days ago in Austin. And I think that the, the conceit of this, uh, you know, this extreme innovation in, within Formula One, I think is, uh, is, is, is unique. And I mentioned earlier that the energy efficiency in terms of harvesting energy from brake heat and exhaust heat is another example. Um, at the same time, you know, we need to go deeper and, and I think that you know, the events, the, uh, the Grand Prix that we host around the world uh, can be done in a more efficient way, reducing the carbon footprint um, and, and how we go about that. And we've just retained a firm uh, which we're just in the, in the throes of getting going and they're, doing, they're talking to a lot of people but 
um, it's very important to us. We're, we have a great story to tell, and we're very proud in terms of the contributions we've made in the macro sense to um, address the environmental issue. But we think we can actually do, do more, and we've reached out to a company called Futura, um, who's an expert in that space. And I think you know, over the next six to nine months, you're going to be hearing you know, a lot of interesting things that, that, you know, that elevate. Um, and I, I, think, you know, I think there's a, a somewhat of a, I wouldn't say it's a fallacy, but it's a, uh, an area that is not being told in terms of sure. electric. You know, the, you know, the impact on the environment of making these batteries, um, the impact on the environment of disposing of them, the fact that uh, you know, coal furnace Electric, you know, electrical plants are the ones that are actually generating the energy to charge these. And so I, I think, you know, I, I think we have a great story to tell, and I think we're in a good spot, and we're conscientious of it. Looking to the future, do you think we'll ever see an autonomous uh, Formula One race? I, I hope not. Um, and the reason I say that is, and, I, and I'm all for autonomously driven vehicles, and uh, I actually have a personal interest in that because I have one of my four sons is a special needs kid and years uh -huh. ago we bought a, an apartment in New York City because that's where we thought he'd have to live for public transportation and health care right. and everything and now you know we, you look at the environment with autonomously driven cars you know there's an opportunity for him to live where he wants to live or use Uber right. Um, right. so but I think you know part of Formula One is the you know is the energy it brings around heroes I mean you know, the big heroes in the sport are the drivers, the personalities. And if you look back at James Hunt or Fangio or Stewart or Prost or Emerson Fittipaldi, who's a local right. Miami resident right. who actually drove his old 1984 McLaren up and down Biscayne Boulevard today, <laughs> you know, those are what you remember. And I think the, the car brands and the, and the participants are, are very important from McLaren to Ferrari to Red Bull to Mercedes, et cetera. But the personalities, you know, those are the heroes of the sport. So I hope we never get to the extent that, uh, you know, we're eliminating, you know, that aspect of the sport. And I think, uh, you know, the human nature or the human aspect drives unpredictability and a level of competition, a level of fandom for people. You know, there's a lot of Alonzo fans out there. And if it was, you know, you know I, I suspect there'd be fewer fans if you could just be, become a fan of the McLaren car. Right, of course. Right? Yeah. Uh, final question. Uh, what keeps you awake at night as you launch on this very exciting journey? Uh, I, um, you know, as the former CEO of Coca-Cola once said, I sleep like a baby. I get up every yeah. two hours and cry. Yeah, sure. um, but uh, <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, I, I actually feel pretty good in terms of where we are. Um, I think complacency is is obviously uh, you know you know one of the issues in terms of you know how do you engender um, you know a constant innovation and and and, and motivating you know, your team to continue to think outside the box. I think at a at an entity in Formula One's kind of stage of development, um, you know we are spending so much time now. You know we created a strategic plan, and we are spending so much time now trying to execute on that plan and you know we just don't have the boots on the ground to do it so it's you know how do we prioritize our um, our strategy and our kind of developed strategy and, and what do you do first and you know how are these things connected um, with everybody you know madly running around trying to I would say you know I put even though as you mentioned earlier it's a 68 year old company we really look at it somewhere between a startup and a business turnaround. Right. And as we're putting, uh, you know, a lot of pressure on people to deliver because we think there's a catch-up opportunity within the sport, it's, you know, it, I think communication is, is key in making sure everyone's talking, communicating, participating. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, I said, you know, I've developed an extraordinarily talented, diverse staff. And I think, you know, getting them together, particularly when you have 21 Grand Prix, right all around the world and nine months of the year, you know, I live on an airplane. Sure. Uh, you know, how do you do that and, and, and engender that, you know, that special sauce that comes out of having a unique set of 10 executives that uh, are running all their disciplines? Mm -hmm. Sean, it's been great to have you. 
Well, good thank luck you. and welcome to Miami. All right, okay. good, good to be in Miami. I always love coming. Thank you. Good, thank you. How'd we do?